Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to week three. So um, I've spent the day going through the plans and uh, a lot of the plans look really great. I've uh, gotten all the plans back to the people that I can. Uh, there were a handful that I'm still working on and there's some people that are still uh, have yet to turn theirs in, but uh, I think most of you have gotten feedback and you're ready to go. So we're going to devote this week to uh, just working on the presentation. You know, we didn't want you to get started too early, but now's the time. This week, we, we've tried to pair out uh, all the other activities so you can really focus in on it. There's a, uh, a lot of phases. You know, we want you to complete the entire presentation this week. So um, you made a plan, and I think the, the, um, the phase that we, we talked about, the, the uh, presentation ecosystem, I think the best thing for most of you to do from this point is to take your plan and turn that into a script and actually write out a script so you can control how much time you're speaking we want to try to go for three to four minutes you know if your piece ends up being under three minutes or over four minutes that's okay go ahead and turn it in but again uh, we're shooting for a target time we want to be able to try to control for that so writing script is one way of doing that another thing great thing about writing a script is that you can rehearse it you don't want to go straight from writing the script to doing the read off. Uh, when you read something for the very first time, it can be heard in your voice. There's a way that you read. There, there's, there's pauses that you have where you're figuring things out and, and uh, so forth. So you want to speak your script aloud as a, uh, for the very first time without recording it. So you can hear it as you're saying it and maybe you even change a few words make it easier to say, and uh, then try recording it. And uh, uh, if you don't like it, record it again. It won't take very long, but the more you do something, the better off uh, uh, you, you are. You, you sound more confident, you get better at it, you're, you're more familiar with the, uh, what's coming next, and uh, you just sound more polished if you know what's going on. So, um, the whole point of a presentation is to come across in a uh, confident and professional manner. And um, one way of doing that is getting a really good reading. Uh, now, some people don't like to read from the script. They just make notes and, and speak spontaneously. And that works, works for some people, but it's hard to control for time. There are a lot of folks that have turned in presentations to me where I told them to make something that's three to four minutes long and they get started talking and lo and behold, their presentation becomes 18 minutes, 25 minutes. They didn't even realize they were talking that long. And so uh, reading from a script is one way of controlling for time as well. And so uh, there are phases through the week that you wanna go through. You wanna write the script, you wanna speak the script out loud, rehearse it, you wanna record it. And you want to get that audio piece done. I really want you to get your audio done first before you start working on the slides, before you start working, opening up PowerPoint and getting into the presentation program. And again, we're going to have a lot of opportunity to work with different presentation programs. So you're going to uh, get your choice. We're going to look at a couple this week. And so um, once you've got your audio, then you're in good shape. You can, you can try it out in a couple of different presentation tools or you can take it into the one that you already feel confident about and work on getting the slides to match the audio. But again, you don't want to start with slides. You want to start with the audio. And, uh, and then that final phase of syncing the slides to the audio to get a, uh, a, a finished presentation piece, you want to try to get that all done by Sunday night so you can turn it in. And so uh, to that extent, We've made this week's discussion board not an assignment. It is not uh, mandatory that you post in the discussion board this week. The discussion board is uh, set up to be sort of tips and feedback. And it's actually going to run for two weeks. It's, gonna, it's open this week, but it's going to be uh, open next week as well. So you can use the same um, discussion board to post your script and get feedback on that, post your audio, get feedback on that. Once you create the presentation itself at the end of the week, we're asking you, we're going to ask you to post your presentation there so your classmates can give you feedback. Now, this is a voluntary thing, 
But um, if it works out right, you'll get some great feedback from your classmates in addition to feedback from me on your project. And that way, when you get the chance to work on it again next week, you'll have all that extra information. So the discussion board this week is something that you should look at. I've already posted a few things there as, as helpful tips, and we'll talk about that. But you do not have to post there. It's not an assignment. So we've taken that off your plate so that you can spend more time working on the presentation. So the only thing we really have for you, uh, in addition to working on the, the, uh, the presentation itself this week, is a little bit more reading. Uh, a few more chapters from Slidology, a few more chapters from Resonate. And uh, the, uh, one of the chapters from Slidology, uh, Nancy is telling us how to create content that has an impact, how to really you know, um, uh, affect the viewers. She also uh, has some chapters on uh, how to structure material. So as we're creating stories out of our notes, uh, you know, figuring out how to tell our own story, how to tell the story of our brand is something we want to work on. And that's why I've given you some, uh, some, some stuff in the uh, discussion board that's going to help with that. And the reading is going to help with that as well. But, uh, you know, Nancy's tips for having an impact, again, laser-like focus on the audience. Make sure you know who you're talking to. Don't, be, don't address a generic audience, address a specific audience. Know what that audience is looking for, know what that audience is affected by, and make sure your design choices, your communication choices, are focused in on meeting their needs. Uh, we want to tell stories. So we want to take all that information we put together on our plan last week and craft that into a story. We want to be able to tell a three to four minute story about who we are, you know, how we got interested in our subject, you know, uh, what we've done to um, gain skills, whether you want to be a creative writer or a 3D animator or a game designer or a cinematographer or an audio engineer, something got you started on your way, you know. Uh, your parents playing music for you as a child or you playing Nintendo as a kid or whatever. So you want to start with your influences and, 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 and let, the, uh, let your dream employer know, you know what influences, what got you started and, and then what developed you along the way. So uh, you want to talk in the middle of your story about how you gained your skills. Now, obviously, there's a section there waiting for full sale. But that's not the only story. That's not the only thing that made you who you are. Um, if you joined the Army, that formed a major part of, of who you are. If you've been working for 10 or 15 years in the regular world and you, you, know, you gained uh, skills from those jobs, uh, uh, life lessons from those jobs, that forms a part of a story of who you are. If you become married and a parent and raised kids, maybe that forms part of the story of who you are. So you want to include the whole life so that the audience, the, the possible employer really gets to know who you are. They want to know how you became who you are, what you believe, what your aesthetics are, what your vision is for uh, the art that you're working in. And they want to know that you have the skills. So uh, whether it's work that you did before full sale, whether you worked in high school or another college or another job, you want to be able to talk about that. Uh, when you talk about full sale, remember, you are already graduated. You're projecting beyond graduation. So don't talk about classes you will take. take talk about classes that you have taken. And you want to look at your curriculum. You want to pick one or two classes. Talk effectively about it. You know, if you, you want to be a cinematographer and you took a lighting class and that informed your sense of how you frame a shot and how you, how you balance, you know, uh, the elements in a, in a, in a composition, you know, those are the things that you can talk about. Now, it's not always going to be possible that you'll know what you learned or what you're anticipating learning from a particular class. But if you go onto the Full Sail website and look uh, up the classes, each class has a course description. You know, it's, it's only two or three sentences, but it should give you enough to know that uh, it's, it's something that you're looking forward to and that you know is going to inform who you are. You know, a lot of video game uh, designers are looking forward to the myths and, and archetypes classes or the, uh, uh, the level building classes or the world building classes. 
those kinds of things. So you can talk about the things that you learned from those classes. And in doing so, you're telling that employer what skills you have, what, um, what your strong points are. And again, we're projecting into the future, but we want you to show evidence of your skill. We want you to have portfolio work. And if this is portfolio work you haven't created yet, you can borrow it from other sources and claim it as your own. But if you're already working right now, if you're already drawing sketches in your sketchbook, if you're designing characters, you can show characters that you've drawn right now. You know, any work that's your own, absolutely feel free to put it in here. Uh, it informs who you are. The more we get a sense of who you are, the better off you are. Uh, if you're a, a musical artist, if you're an audio engineer, and you wanna show off some uh, sample music, uh, that's a great thing to do. Uh, when you're showing off a sample, don't talk over it. Just play it as a sample. Don't play too much of it. Uh, I recommend that you not play more than 20 seconds of a single piece as a sample. So you might wanna have one or two songs and play different samples, uh, but more than that becomes uh, an imbalance between you talking and there being sample material. You don't want to have uh, more sample material than voiceover. In, in the four minutes that you're using, uh, you know, uh, well over 50% has to be you talking all the way through. Uh, and I want, and, but it, you talking about your own work is something that the audience is really going to want to hear. That's an, something an employer will understand and relate to and be able to make a choice and decision about you. So as you craft these stories, you tell who you are, remember the takeaway, you're standing up there and you're directly addressing that company and saying, I know who you are, I, I know your company culture, I know the products that you make and I know what I can do and I, I wanna join your thing, I want to be part of your company. Then that ask, that takeaway is an important part of each one of these presentations. It's a, it's a visualization you do for yourself that's kind of an affirmation. So in addition to telling stories, there's a visual component to this. Once you've got your uh, audio created, you wanna find the images, the slides that will help tell that story to the best extent possible. And uh, as an aid to that, one of the things we wanna work on today, I have a little exercise for us to play around with. Uh, in, we wanna show, don't tell them. And that means that sometimes we're gonna talk about sort of abstract ideas. If you, if you look at your resume, uh, there's probably a lot of things in there that are uh, not directly illustratable. Like, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a go-getter, I'm a team player, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very reliable. And these are concept words. And how do you illustrate a concept? How do you visualize ideas? So uh, visualizing ideas is an important artistic um, uh, trait to work on. And to that extent, uh, I want to um, uh, ha have us work on a little exercise that I put together. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna drop the URL for this page in the discussion board and you guys can all click on it. And uh, for those of you watching on the video, uh, this, this uh, page is going to be linked to in the discussion board. So you can participate throughout the week on your own if you wish. But what I've done is I've created a, a live Google Doc. Uh, Google Docs means that everyone who's logged in can participate uh, or, or can edit that page. They have full editing privileges. Now this is a kind of a dangerous thing. We have to work cooperatively together because one person could just hit select all and delete everything and destroy the page for us. So we have to learn how to work together. Now what happens is each one of these people, uh, there's several of us all connected right now. You can see this little animal symbols up here. And when you have a different color, your cursor is that color. So if you want to know where your cursor is, it's the color that of the icon that you have. And uh, wherever your cursor is, that's where you will affect things. So what I've done here is I've created a, um, a row of squares, uh, all attached to different words, different 
uh, terms that you might use to talk about yourself. But how will you visualize this for your audience? It's easy to say these things. They, they, we, say, we all say them, we all put them on our resumes, and they become cliches. You're adventurous, you're dependable, you're a team player, you're eager, you're a problem solver. Now, from a storytelling point of view, can you find the image that says that and says that in a way that is unique to you, that is unique to the audience that you're trying to teach, to talk to? You know, uh, if you're speaking to people who are filmmakers, then the imagery that you want to create is maybe film clips or you know, images from movies. If you're speaking to video game designers, maybe you want to use game art. So each different audience might have different types of imagery that they respond to best. Graphic designers or uh, uh, storytellers might you know, relate to artwork better. Uh, but again, there are two aspects of this. The, the imagery you pick speaks to your own level of visual sophistication and the imagery you pick speaks to whom you're talking to. You know, when we go into PowerPoint and use the um, bundled clip art, which is usually a lot of cartoons, you know, we can, we can drop those images in and everybody will get that. Oh, here's a cartoon image of a tree. You're talking about a tree. But the level of sophistication of that art is that it works on three, uh, third graders. So if you're trying to impress an employer, that might not be the art you want to use. You might want to use something a little more sophisticated, a little more tailored to who they are. Remember, we're speaking to this audience and we know who they are. We know what they think about. We know what they care about. So you want to choose imagery that will speak to that. So the, the idea for this exercise is that I want you to choose one or more of these words, you don't have to do them all, and this is just voluntary, you don't have to do it at all, but pick one word, put one term, and try to find an image that would tell that image, or tell, display that in a story that would have a great impact. So here I've done the first one here, where I'm, um, my idea of, of illustrating adventurous is a guy standing on a cliff, looking out over the mountaintop, thinking about adventure. And it's a painting and you know it's uh, very dramatic and so forth. So what I want you guys to do is stake out a spot. I've got lots of different uh, cells here. So there's plenty of room for everybody. You don't have to be on the first row, but uh, if you're gonna work on adventurous, make sure you're in this row uh, or in this column. If you're gonna work on uh, eager, make sure you're in this column here, et cetera. So just stay underneath the term that you are. And, we have a big image, or a big square and a small square. In the small square, what I want you to do is put your name on it. And that's sort of staking out that square so that another per person who's also logged in won't accidentally take your spot. So before you actually search for your picture, just claim an area. So I'm gonna do another one here. I'm gonna claim, I'm gonna do team player and I put my name here. So that means I want this one. And I'm gonna now put my cursor in the big spot and you can see my cursor is black i'm the first person here so i my color is black your color may be different but once you've take, staked out a square put your cursor in the big spot and that means that when you actually select an image it's going to drop into the big spot so the interesting thing about this uh page you know this is this is a, a page that was designed by google and so they have search built into the very page in order to do an image search, you come up to insert. See in the menu here, we have insert. Go to insert image, search the web. And when you do that, the right-hand side of the page becomes a search engine that just searches Google images and returns them. So the first thing you're probably gonna to wanna to do is just take that term. So I'm, I'm doing team player. Now I don't really want you to necessarily have to do that term. And I really don't want you to be the, the person who always picks the very first thing that's returned on Google Images. I want you to search and find the thing that really works for you. So we're getting a lot of uh, soccer here and uh, I see a hockey team and whatnot, more soccer. So, uh, you know, that's, that's high there, but you could just keep going. There's plenty of search engine here. You know, when you search on Google, there's millions of words. But I actually have a particular image in mind of what I want to put here. 
So instead of actually searching on, on the term team player, I'm going to put in skydive team. Because I have this notion of these guys jumping in space, you know, forming, mate, gathering together in a formation before they pull their parachutes. So I want to find one of those images. And here's a really good one. This, is, this speaks to what I'm wanting to say. So I choose this image and I select it. And when I select it, it has a blue check mark on it. And down at the bottom, it says one image selected, insert. So with that in selected, I can come here and hit the insert button. And at my cursor, it comes in and that's how you put your page in. So you guys can be working on this. I'm gonna go back to, le to speaking you know, uh, about uh, the rest of the stuff. But while we're working, you guys can do this. And uh, you're gonna find that this is also, if you're watching the video, this is linked into the discussion board. So you can actually choose to do this on your own and we can talk about your choices in the discussion board and so forth. And uh, you know, later uh, after we're, we're done uh, talking, we'll come back and see how you guys did. Uh, don't feel like you have to do them all, but you know, I would definitely appreciate you trying to do one just to see how you can manage this to sort of show off what kind of uh, art choices you would make, et cetera. You know, um, the range is all over the place. You can choose artwork, you can choose game art, you can choose photographs, you can choose different kinds of photographs, you can choose, um, you know, uh, special uh, colors and, and uh, graphic designs and, and so forth. So uh, you can have illustrations. Uh, you can search for anything and it should all be there available in the, uh, the Google search tool. So uh, you guys can work on that and uh, I'll come back to that. But like I said, that was linked to in the discussion board. So in the discussion board, I also have a couple of videos that I want you to take a look at and they're gonna be helpful for you in figuring out the structure of the story that you wanna tell. You know, last week I had you put together elements for the beginning, elements for the middle, elements for the end, you know, just everything you could think of, throw it in there, whether you're actually gonna use it or not. And so now you have all this material, hopefully. And now you have to form that material into a story, which means you're gonna pick and choose, but you're actually going to figure out what you're gonna say and how you're gonna move from one element to another and what it all is going to amount to. So figuring out the story that you want to tell about yourself and your skills and your talents. Um, uh, just last, like last week, everybody did a great job on your emotional story. Everybody told a different kind of story. So uh, in, in the same way, uh, in, in talking about yourself and your skills, there's a million ways to tell a story. And so you, you're, there's not a single formula. There's the way that you want to figure out. And to that end, I have a couple of movies that I think are going to be helpful for people. The first one is a, a TED Talk. It's by a fellow named Simon Sinek. And uh, it's called Start With Why. And so a lot of people who have trouble figuring out how do they tell a story about themselves or how do they take all the material about who they are, basically your resume, and turn it into a story. You know, if you put all the elements of your resume down, that would be that series of facts. You know, in, in week one, we talked about boring sports, uh, boring uh, PowerPoints. And, and I guarantee you, if you took your resume and you turned it into a PowerPoint, that would be a boring PowerPoint. It would be all the amazing stuff that you've done in your life, but it's just a list of facts. It's just that you know, then I worked here, then I worked here, then I did this, then I got this award, blah, blah, blah. And so you'd be listing off things and moving from point to point. How can you take those same elements and create a story out of it? Well, uh, Simon Sinek's easy solution, it's amazing, is to just turn that box on its head. Your resume is a list of what you have done. And he says, keep the resume, keep all those elements, but instead of saying what you've done, start with why. Take each element that's in your resume, and instead of just saying that you did this, that you, you know, played drum in, 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 in the marching band in high school, tell us why you did it. 
that's the beginning of a story. We, we get your intrinsic motivations. We get where your passions come from. You know, don't just tell me that you played drum in the, in the, in the marching band. Tell me why you played drum in the marching band. You, you, you love the camaraderie, that you, you love the, the uh, living with the rhythms and, 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 and playing in a showy style and whatever there was about that. Tell me why. That becomes the story. That becomes an insight into who you are. And so for all the elements of your life, all those items that you've put on your plan that you need to tell a story about, tell us why you did them. Tell us why you made the choice to go to the Army. Tell us why you got married and had kids. Those answers are going to be fascinating. And that is storytelling. And uh, it's just a simple way of looking at the material that you have and figuring out how to craft a story out of it. Um, and for a lot of people, I think that's going to be very helpful. I highly recommend that everybody watch the Simon Sinek video. And even if it doesn't end up showing you what you want to do, I think you'll find that it's something that informs the way you, you think about storytelling and structure. The second one is a little more esoteric. It's called How to Structure a Video Essay. It's by a fellow named Tony Zo. And what he's done is he's, he's looked at a, uh, an Orson Welles documentary. Orson Welles is a famous filmmaker from the 40s and 50s. And he made a documentary called F for Fake that had more than one subject, had more than two subjects, had more than three subjects. It actually had six different items in the film. And instead of being six separate little films that all played and you know, one ended and the next began, he told them all in parallel. He'd start one story and tell a little bit of it and then stop and move to the next. And that created a kind of uh, um, mystery and rhythm that made the storytelling very interesting. Uh, it's a little bit of akin to um, Game of Thrones. If you watch the movie, the TV series Game of Thrones, you know, it starts across this entire world kingdom, many kingdoms, and it has a cast of hundreds or thousands of people. And so as the story plays out, it jumps from scene to scene once it's in the desert and then it's in the, it's in the, uh, uh, the forest and then it's in the, the snow and then it's at the kingdom and so forth. And each time you, you find a little bit about each character and then you jump and you find a little bit more about each story. It's a story told in parallel. On well, Game of Thrones, it's a 75-hour story that eventually winds down and all those characters end up meeting together at the end, the ones that are still alive. Uh, with F for Fake, each one of these six elements had their conclusion or else folded into another part of the story. And so uh, this is an interesting way to tell a story. Instead of telling it in sequence or chronologically, you tell it in parallel, a little bit of each time, a little bit part of each, um, a bit at a time. And this is something that for a lot of you who've had kind of a, a strange life experience, you're not exactly sure what it all means yourself. You know, you uh, started out to be a lawyer and then you ended up being in the army and then you, you uh, drove a truck for a while and, and whatnot. And you had these multiple careers and they're all part of what made you who you are. You know, instead of just putting that in chronological order, which might seem at that point random, telling it in parallel might mean that you are on a life path that is headed in a particular direction. And um, the interesting thing about it is that we can all kind of relate to this brand of storytelling because he compares it to uh, the TV show South Park, the uh, comedy about the kids in Colorado. Uh, every single element of Every single episode of South Park is 22 minutes long and it has three different story elements that run in parallel and come together at the end. That's the story structure of South Park, every single episode. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to watch. Uh, we've all probably seen South Park, but you haven't really thought about how it was structured. Uh, thinking how things are structured makes you a better storyteller. You then start to see some insight into how to put things together. And there's no one true way to do this. Each one of you has a different story to tell. Each one of you has a different 
way to tell the story at a different point in your life. So this is a chance to play around with structure and um, uh, learn to grow as a storyteller. Um, another one of the elements that you'll be reading about uh, this week uh, is about how to relate to your audience. We've talked about picking the audience and knowing who the audience are, but what are the audience gonna think of you? And uh, that has a lot to do with how you come across to them. And uh, to that extent, people have been standing in front of audiences and speaking publicly for thousands of years. And one of the things that you'll be reading about is something that um, Aristotle, who lived about 3,000 years ago in Greece, where they did a lot of public speaking, wrote about the three pillars of public speaking. There are three different ways to appeal to an audience, depending upon your relationship to them. This is something that uh, Aristotle figured out by having watched it, a, lot of, a lot of people talk to a lot of different audiences. So the first way you can appeal to them is to appeal to their, their sense of trust, or their credibility. You can stand there and say, please believe me because I'm an expert on this material, or I'm a trustworthy person, or I'm sincere. So the audience is going to accept what you have to say based on the fact that you have a level of uh, trust with them. Now, that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes you're a newcomer. I mean, we think about the situation we're headed here. All of you are going to be young folk, just graduated from school. Uh, maybe, you've got a, maybe you're going to say you've had other jobs or not. Maybe you only have your degree. But you're going up to talk to these prestigious folk who run these companies that you highly admire. You know, you're talking to Google. You're talking to Apple. You're talking to Blizzard. And you'll feel intimidated. So how, how are you going to get them to respect you? Are you going to have a great resume? Are you going to have great material that they're going to respond to? Or are you going to have to say, well, I know I'm young, but think about the enthusiasm that I have. So if, if the audience isn't going to trust you or believe you, then they can appeal, you can appeal to their emotions. Pathos is the appeal to emotion. And you can get them to understand that you're just like they were 20 years ago. You know, someone who's eager, who needs a chance, who just, you know, is, is, is full of ideas and full of vitality, but they, you know, don't have the 30 years of experience that the person they're talking to has. An appeal to pathos is something that you can do as an alternative, as an appeal to ethos. And the third appeal is where you're trying to build a case that, no one can poke any holes into. It's a case of logic. The third case is logos, the appeal to logic. And here, everything you say has to be backed up. If you give a fact, you have to say where it came from, or you, you, you're giving footnotes. If, you, if you're uh, showing charts, you say where they came from. You do not want to introduce ideas or facts that someone can say, well, I don't know if that's true. Everything you say, you want to be very buttoned up about. And so the appeal to logic is you're making an ironclad case. And if the audience can't find fault with it, then they have to agree with you. And so um, there's not a lot of emotion in that. Uh, and again, they're not really necessarily relying on you as a trustworthy person. They're relying on the words, the facts, the images that you have to say. And you're being very fastidious about making sure that uh, the logic behind everything you say is backed up. So each of these has a couple of elements to it. In ethos, the audience asks, is, does the audience respect you? Does the audience believe you're a good character? Does the audience believe you're generally trustworthy? Um, does the audience believe that you're an authority on this topic? Now, the authority part can be a little bit misleading. If you stand up there and they've never met you, but you've got, you know, an alphabet soup behind your name, your, your, your PhD, and, uh, an MD, and R, you know, an XYPZ, they may respect you just because you've gotten all these accolades and awards, or maybe you've written a book, or you've been on TV, or whatnot. But you can still be respected by not 
and not have that material because you can come across as someone who is trustworthy. For instance, uh, you know, you might not be a doctor or anything, but you want to speak about cancer and you'll stand up there and you'll say, I want to speak about this because of my lived experience. My mother had cancer and I took care of her for six years. And this is, this is where that, lear that experience comes from, that authority for me to speak about this topic comes from. So this isn't necessarily uh, um, a credential that makes you trustworthy, it's lived experience. And again, it has to do with the way the audience uh, perceives you. So uh, that also means that it has to do with how well you use HAIL, H-A-I-L, in your direction to the audience because um, you may be saying everything true, but if you don't say it in a way that they believe you, uh, that won't work out either. So you've got to seem authentic. You've got to feel trustworthy to the end. In pathos, um, do your words evoke feelings of love, sympathy, fear? So if you're trying to get the audience to like you, you know, you might be showing pictures of puppies or, you know, uh, beautiful material or whatnot. Those are attempts to, to evoke happy feelings. But the thing about pathos is you, you can evoke all feelings. So it's a little bit dangerous sometimes because you can invoke uh, feelings of hate as well as love. If you're just simply trying to get someone to like you who's never met you, then you want to deal with these very, you know, sort of uh, naive, happy emotions. You don't ever want to take it to the other place. But an awful lot of it is, is of, of public speaking is based on the opposite here. Do your visuals evoke feelings of compassion, envy? Does your characterization of the competition evoke feelings of hate, contempt? Now, you don't have to deal with any of this because you are not talking about your competition. And let me reiterate that. I don't want anybody, when you're using your three or four minutes, this is a precious three or four minutes that you've been given. It's a gift to talk to your dream employer. Do not, do not say, I know there are a thousand other people you could hire. Somebody else could say that, but you don't have to say that. This is your four minutes, so don't introduce negative thoughts into your presentation because they weren't there before you brought them up. If you come in with a negative attitude of saying, oh, I know there are a lot of people you're gonna hire, or why should you hire me? Why should you ask that question? You do not have to introduce that into this presentation. Someone else could. It could happen outside of your control, but this is three or four minutes of your control, so do not invoke a negative feeling when you don't need to. But in terms of, of uh, using a pathos, um, quite often in television advertising, uh, TV advertising wants you to uh, uh, feel bad about the other, their competition. You don't have any competition, but if, if you were selling cornflakes, you know, you don't have to say you're the best. You can just say the other people are awful. And this is something that happens an awful lot in pol politics. We're about to go into the political season. And uh, I, well over 90% of all political ads are negative ads, which means that instead of saying I'm a great person, they say my candidate, my, 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 uh, um, my competitor is an awful person. Don't vote for him, her. Um, and that's what negative advertising is. It gets you to feel bad about the other person. It doesn't necessarily make you any better. So these are very powerful emotions and they're, they're something that can get away from you very quickly. So you wanna be very careful in using negative emotions because sometimes they can redound or backfire upon you. Logos is all about making sense. Uh, does your message make sense? Is your message based on facts, statistics, and evidence? Will your call to action lead to the desired outcome you promised? It's almost like a lawyer at the end of a trial making his summation. You, you remark on every piece of evidence that you brought forth. You remind people that uh, they saw this and this is true and that's based on this and this leads to that. And you're, you're, the last line of your call to action in this presentation is really the summation of everything you have to say. Based on everything I've told you, you should hire me. 
Based on everything I've told you, you should join this cause. Based on everything I've told you, you should buy this product. A logos-based argument builds towards the exact call to action that you're working on. And uh, for a lot of you guys, uh, if you're in a, um, a technical field, if you want to become a programmer or a web designer or something like that, uh, a logos-based argument, uh, I've learned these languages, you know, I've done this work, I know these programs, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to work on these kinds of projects, uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, that's probably going to be the way an employer looks at hiring is, you know, who is the most logical person to hire, not the most fun. Uh, and it, it really depends upon the field. Uh, you know, if you're uh, looking to find someone in graphic design, they'll probably want someone fun. But if you're looking for someone in programming, they want somebody who knows his stuff, her stuff. So these things can overlap. You can have something that's mainly ethos, but is partly pathos, they overlap a little. It's doubtful that they all will overlap, but if they do, you certainly have hit the mark. But um, you're, this is not something you actually plan in so much as discover about what your relationship to the audience is. So um, that's an interesting thing to just keep in your head and, and, and help you to make the choices that you need to make about what you're going to work on. And so as we go through and cre uh, create all these elements, uh, you know, uh, remember that we're going to get a chance next week to come back and work on and make things better. Next week is all about feedback and improvement. And this week is about getting things done, starting with that blank canvas, making some creative choices, getting some things down, turning something in. It's so important to turn something in. Uh, real artist ship. That's a quote from Steve Jobs. So um, we want you to get there and, 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 and get the presentation in. And then next week, you get a chance to make it even better. So um, that's all it about the reading. Uh, I can come back here and we can see some choices people are making. Uh, it has a really cool picture of some dogs. Uh, we have a great graphic here of a problem solver. So Journal uh, has a you know a complex graphic. Uh, Mark Claypool picked some video game art that's pretty dramatic uh, for team player. Not quite sure how it says team player to me, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm willing to listen to the uh, to the explanation. And um, Olfet uh, has a uh, a journal. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, a gymnast, and there might be two people there. I don't know if, if the whole picture is loaded, uh, but uh, dependable, maybe uh, there are people working together. So uh, some great uh, ideas there, and uh, we can come back to those. But um, those are the uh, elements that we're talking about. If you, in the discussion board, uh, note that uh, not only did I put in the movies, here's the Simon Sinek movie, here is the Tony Zhou movie. I uh, put in the several links here. So if you're looking for software uh, to use, we last week we recommended Adobe Spark. Some people were having trouble with Adobe. Uh, it's the first time that had happened, but uh, we have a couple of different choices here. And I actually have an article here that uh, links in. It, uh, it says 31 uh, alternatives they've actually been updating it and it now has 40 in there so there's a list of online tools that you can use some of which we uh, recommend and some of which we don't Prezi is not great for this particular um, assignment it's a it's a cool tool that a lot of people use emails is really good they have uh, nice online material uh, things like Prezi and um, uh, email emails and uh, Google Slides don't have their own audio. So you're going to have to do audio on your own in order to make them work. Uh, you can add audio to them as well. Adobe Spark does include audio. And uh, for those of you on older phones that have been having trouble uh, working, finding tools that you can work with, VoiceThread is something that works on older Android phones. Uh, it's not uh, real sophisticated but it allows you to do everything you need to do. It allows you to put in a voice over, to record a voice over through it, 
and allows you to add slides. So you have to bring in your own images, but you can put that together. And it works online and you can basically link to it and uh, turn in your image as, as you link to it. Now, those of you that want to do audio on your own, we recommend a tool called Audacity. There's a link here where you can download it. Uh, it's available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's not available on uh, phones, so it's, it's not a phone tool. But we also have an article here about Android auto, audio apps. So if you're on an Android phone and you want to use audio, uh, there are some choices there. And we have an article talking about how to use the voice memo tool that ships for free with the iPhone uh, that you can use to record with your, uh, your smartphone or your iPad. And then here's the link to visualizing ideas, the, the thing that uh, we were showing earlier to this week. Uh, if you're online, you can, you can use that to uh, uh, watch. And again, we are recommending that you post material up to get feedback from your classmates. So if you want someone to look at your script or listen to some audio or give you, uh, you know, uh, some feedback on how you're, how far, how you're doing so far, uh, that's what this week's discussion board is all about. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is uh, something about PowerPoint. We have gifted everyone with PowerPoint and we, th we think PowerPoint is pretty amazing. Uh, the thing about PowerPoint is it's very, uh, it has an awful lot of options. So if you've never used PowerPoint, you're going to find that it is a little overwhelming. Let me load something up here. Uh, so I just picked a template and I'm in slide one here. And this is the interface of PowerPoint. And we have a number of uh, um, tool face or interface tools here uh, for things that you can do. Uh, basically to create slides and uh, to move back and forth between them. So there are eight menus here and the same menus are at the top. Uh, you, each menu gives you different access to tools. You can add uh, things. The slides are templated so that they look a particular way. I'm gonna create a, a, menu, um, a series of slides really quick. So I'm just going to title this my brand and uh, put my name on it. Oh, I don't want to use too many R's and Daryl. Uh, all right, and so I'm going to add a few more slides. So I'll add slide two and uh, probably enough I'll call that two. And I'll add a slide three and I'll call that three. Now, the reason I want, did this is I wanted to show you something that is here in PowerPoint that is hidden. Uh, PowerPoint has so many features that just opening it up and stumbling around sometimes won't let you know where everything is. And um, so if you've never used PowerPoint before or you're intimidated by PowerPoint, that's why we have given you all these other options. Uh, Adobe uh, Spark is an option. Google Slides is an option. Google Slides actually looks an awful lot like PowerPoint with fewer options. So if you want to eventually start using PowerPoint, but you want to get started, Google Slides may be a good way to get started. But uh, all, these, uh, all these options here in um, PowerPoint, some are uh, clear about what you do and some aren't. And one of the things that I want you guys to do is to record a single piece of audio and run it across all the slides. And lots of times people don't do that because they can't figure out how to do it. They haven't made it obvious in the, in the software here. And software somehow, I don't know when this ever happened, but they stopped shipping with manuals. Used to be when you bought a piece of software, you get a manual with it and it'll tell you how to do things. Now I guess you're supposed to go watch uh, YouTube tutorials or something like that. But um, people think that you can only have audio per slide and that's not true. You can have one piece of audio 
that runs continuously through the whole thing. And that is the best way to do this presentation because it gives you the most creative freedom. And it also doesn't mean that you have to know what the slides are before you can record the audio, which is the most important thing. So the way that you would do that is that you have to be on slide one. And on slide one, you record your audio. So in PowerPoint, they have a, an audio recording tool. You would go to insert audio, record audio. And it's not very full featured, but there's a little tool here that when I click on it, it starts to record and it's recording my voice now. So I'm actually making a recording. This is where you would speak and you'd, you'd after a couple of rehearsals, you'd make your three or four minute speech. And when you hit stop, insert, it puts that file on slide one. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Um, your slide, uh, your uh, video um, hasn't been recording for a little bit. We tried putting it in the chat. You didn't see it, so I figured I'd let you know. <laughs> when did it stop recording? Um, just before you started, uh, or before you opened the uh, Google Slides, I believe. Oh, dear. Uh, okay, well, what that, what that means is that I'm going to have to actually link in uh, last month's video for folks. But I'll finish this for you guys right now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to let no, you know. No, no. I'm happy you told me that because I, otherwise I would not have known. And, okay. uh, you know, I, that would have been a, a terrible thing. Uh, it says it's recording. All right. Uh, anyway, the, the deal is that we're just not seeing your screen is what it is. Say what? We're not seeing your screen at all. It's still recording, but we're not seeing your screen. Uh, how do I make you see my screen? Maybe unshare it and reshare it. Are we back? Yep. All right. I apologize for that. So maybe the recording worked, but uh, you lost uh, the part of the recording won't have the, uh, the video on it. Uh, I'll have to make a determination whether I, I put this recording up or not. But uh, thank you for telling me that. I, I need you guys to keep me uh, uh, focused on that because I just get lost. Once I start talking, I can't stop talking. Um, anyway, uh, the deal on the audio with PowerPoint is that there are options in the menus that you aren't able to access unless you actually have an audio file. So you have to actually record your audio and put it on slide one and select it before the options are available. So uh, if you look here, there are eight menu options or uh, 10, you know, whatever. When I select the audio file and additional two options are available to me, audio format and audio playback. And if I select audio playback, I have two options that are important to me. I can start playing the audio automatically, which is what I want you guys to do. I don't want anyone to have to click to engage the audio, but most importantly, you can click play across slides. When you have this clicked, then the audio on slide one will then continue to play as you move forward through the slideshow. If you didn't do that, next each time you advance to the slide, it would stop playing the audio. And I think a lot of people try to do this, don't know about that hidden menu, and they get very frustrated. So I wanna, wanna show that to people. But uh, what happens when you have all of your audio on slide one, now I don't have three or four minutes, but I have about 15 seconds here. But uh, once you have your audio in place, and you've got your slides, then you can do something called record slideshow. If you go up to the menu, there is something called record slideshow. And when I click on this, the uh, PowerPoint is gonna go into playback mode and it's gonna start showing slide one and start playing the audio for me continuously. And I can just watch and wait for the right transition point. And when the right time in the audio happens, I can click to advance to slide two and it will record that and just keep going to the end. So let me do this right now. I'm going to hit record slideshow. Got it. 
It starts to record. Now we're in playback. So the audio are recorded. recorded. So I'm actually making a recording. So I'm going to advance now to two. You, after a couple of rehearsals. And I'm going to advance to three. Four minutes each. And then I'm going to stop. So now it asks if I want to save it. And I say yes. And when I come back, it has now put six seconds of the audio on slide one, four seconds of the audio on slide two, four seconds of the audio on slide three. And if I give this file to anyone, it'll play back in exactly that order. And if I didn't get the sync exactly right, I can just come back and rerun record slideshow and keep doing it until I get it exactly the way I want it. Now the advantage of this is uh, later on, you may turn in a slide deck with six slides and I say, terrific slideshow, add three more slides. If you had audio on your slides, you'd be a little bit screwed right there. But if I tell you to add more slides and you need to go out and find more images to make, to give the thing more pace, remember you shouldn't hold on any slide any longer than 20 seconds or so. Uh, just visually in terms of the way PowerPoint presentations pace themselves. So for a three to four minute presentation, you definitely want to have, you know, nine to 12 slides and maybe more, 15 or 20. Uh, you don't need to go nuts with it. You know, more than 20 is, uh, you don't have to worry about that, but you want to at least make sure that you've got somewhere in the 10 to 15 slides uh, range. And you can mix them around. You can, you can change slides. And when you want to come back after week, uh, week three and revise it for week four, you want to be able to make changes, add slides, move the slides around, and you can do any and all of that. And as soon as you do, all you need to do is come back and rerun, record slideshow. As long as the audio stays on slide one, you will then have the chance to reset the sync and move uh, and, and do a new recording. And whenever you have it finalized, you can turn that in and that is the order that the show will go in. So uh, that, that secret menu, uh, again, you have to select the audio file and then you can see the playback file. And that's where you get those choices. Uh, I wanna make sure that you guys have those, uh, uh, an awareness of that when you're working on PowerPoint, because otherwise it becomes uh, uh, very frustrating to not have that information. So uh, that's all I really wanted to get to. Uh, do you guys have any questions? I know I talked a lot about a lot of stuff. You might have some questions about other things. Uh, you guys um, have any questions for me? Yeah, you did mention it as an option. Uh, can I use iMovie uh, for this presentation? Absolutely. Um, I, I would still prefer that you just do an audio track with images. You can actually, some of those images can be video if you want or whatnot, but uh, it's really simple. You just lay the audio track down first and then you can just bring in images and you, 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 you pull them along the soundtrack so that the image is four seconds or six seconds or however long you want it to be. Okay, cool. Anybody else have any questions? Well, I'm going to be around all week. So, you know, as you start running into issues and again, uh, some people have had some difficulties with the system. Uh, we'll, we'll try to work all those things out. Uh, but, uh, if you have any problems, get a hold of me. I'll be around. I want to want to be able to to take care of any uh, um, technical problems you have, uh, and and be available for you. Uh, I'm going to be able to uh, give you feedback on your emotional stories uh, tomorrow, um, and uh, we'll give you a little more information about that and so forth. So, you guys have a great week. This is the time to be creative. I want you to have a lot of fun this week, and uh, uh, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Thanks, guys. Is there a, uh, I'll back just, okay, no problem.